you unfortunately are not going to be free of of comparison just by getting off social media. It can help. You know, we're we're so hardwired. There was a great study that we looked at when we were writing the book where researchers were looking at monkeys and they gave them food. And when every monkey had like a, I think it was a slice of cucumber, the group was like really happy, great, they had food. But then when some of the monkeys were given like a grape, which was a big upgrade for <laughs> monkey food, the monkeys who still got a cucumber were like no longer happy. And so this is really, it's really hardwired. Um, and, you know, we get text messages. We run into people at the grocery store. We see people, you know, we see celebrities. Like it's, it's all around us. Molly, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. So great to have you. Um, I could not think of a more appropriate title for the world we live in today. And the title of the book, I'll repeat it again, Big Feelings, How to Be Okay When Things Are Not Okay. That just seems like 2022. <laughs> this, is, this is our world. Um, but to rewind, let's start with the why behind this book for, for you and Liz. Why, why this book? Our first book came out in 2019 and it was called No Hard Feelings. And after that, we both went to, through some really difficult times personally and professionally. And we realized like, okay, there, there actually are some really hard feelings to work through. Um, and um, I had just moved across the country. I was dealing with some chronic health issues. Uh, I was very lonely, went through a period of really deep depression and despair. Liz's father-in-law was dying of cancer. Um, and so in January of 2020, we pitched an idea for writing a book about difficult emotions to our editors. And they said, well, like, we think that's sort of a niche audience. Like, you know, who's going to want to read a book that sounds really depressing? And we said, okay, you know, we hear you. And then in June of 2020, so after the pandemic had started, they came back to us and they said, actually, we'll buy that book because <laughs> this is the only thing that people are experiencing right now. Um, and so really it's about how regular people move through difficult emotions. And we wrote the book that we really needed to read and thought about what are the difficult emotions that we have been experiencing over the past couple of years. And I, I was really wanting to hear stories of, you know, how do people handle these things to make us all feel less alone and to know that we can move through these emotions. They, they are, are really challenging sometimes, but um, what, what is the deeper need behind them and, and what can we learn from them? And so in the book, you do, do such an incredibly thorough job of, of walking through what you call the seven big feelings. There's uncertainty, comparison, anger, burnout, perfectionism, despair, and regret. And, and as I'm reading the book and I'm, I'm seeing the big seven, I'm like, yep, yep. 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 Uh, makes total sense. But I'm curious, like, how did you get to the seven? What was that process like? Yeah, it was it was a lot of narrowing down. And there were a couple that we didn't include mainly because we felt like other authors had covered them really well. So shame, Brene Brown own shame. We love her. We could not write a better book on that. Um, grief. There's actually been a lot of really good books recently written about grief and and that moving through the, you know, the five stages of grief isn't exactly how it always works. Um, and so we said, okay, we're not going to do better on those, but what are the areas where we think we have some unique to say and where we've experienced those. And then we also try to think about using words that people would relate to. So we have a chapter on comparison. And for a long time, we were calling that chapter envy. But envy is such a loaded word in our society that people didn't even relate to it. They were like, no, nah, I don't I don't feel envy. But we said, well, do you feel comparison? They were like, oh, yeah, I feel a lot of comparison. Um, and then we also reached out to readers and we said, what, which of these emotions have you experienced in the last year and, um, tried to figure out which ones were most popular, if you will. You know, you mentioned comparison. I know that's number two, but we'll, we'll start there. And I, I think we just all, all experience this one, whether we want to or not, no matter how much we try to avoid it. And so what are some of the common, and you do this so well in the book, for, for each chapter you walk through the, 
some of the most common myths. So let, let's start there. What, what are some of the common myths when it comes to comparison? One of the things that I, I wish was true, but is not true, is that if we just get off Instagram or whatever platform we're using, that we'll be free of comparison. And unless you are really like living off the grid, you unfortunately are not going to be free of of comparison just by getting off social media. It can help, and and we can talk about that. But, um, you know, we're we're so hardwired. There was a great study that we looked at when we were writing the book where researchers were looking at monkeys and they gave them food. And when every monkey had like a, I think it was a slice of cucumber, the group was like really happy. Great. They had food. But then when some of the monkeys were given like a grape, which was a big upgrade for monkey food, the monkeys who still got a cucumber were like no longer happy. And so this is really, it's really hardwired. Um, And, you know, we get, text messages. We run into people at the grocery store. We see people, you know, we see celebrities, like it's, it's all around us. Um, so that's one of them. And then I think the other is, um, this idea that like, we shouldn't be comparing ourselves to others that we're like, we have to shut that down. And again, it's so hardwired. It's really hard to shut that down. And so one of the, the myths that we bust is like, you know, the less you compare yourselves to others, the better. And actually, if you can compare yourself to more people, like you can pick up broader baseline and pick people who are doing, you know, if you're trying to run, like pick people who have never even run before, um, that can make you feel better. Because most of the time we only engage in like upwards comparison, which is against people who are, we perceive to be doing better than us. And that doesn't make us feel great. Yeah, in some ways, it's ex- expressing a sense of gratitude. Instead of comparing yourself up, comparing yourself, I, I hate to use the word down, but I'll use the word word down. And that's what psychologists call it, downwards comparison. Yeah, yeah. And so you mentioned envy. And, and what do you think envy reveals about us? Because it also happens. Yeah, yeah. So envy reveals what we want, and that can be a really helpful thing if we allow ourselves to see it in that light. And again, I, you know, I think envy, we're like, oh, I shouldn't be feeling envy. So we immediately shut it down and we're like, I'm not going to learn from it. But, but envy tells us that there's something that we don't have that we want. And that can either be helpful of like, great, like, how can I go get that as well? And I think we we think about these things as like zero sum sometimes. So it's like, oh, well, this person has this great job and that means I can't have it. Well, like you probably can't have that exact job, but like you could go have a similar job and what are the steps that you'd want to take to get there? And then on the other hand, it can also reveal like your own mental state around something that you want that maybe is difficult and, and you just have to accept that you can't have it. So I write in the book about, Um, going through dealing with infertility and having be really difficult to see, especially on social media, people having kids and um, babies everywhere. And there wasn't a lot that I could like, you know, do to take action. I mean, you know, there are some things, but ultimately it was just like accepting where I was at in that moment and reminding myself like, yeah, this is a sign that this is something that I I really want. And that's that's really all that it is. You know, it reminds me, of a show we had with Arthur Brooks. Oh yeah, I love him. Yeah, he, he phenomenal. Uh, we we went deep on purpose, and he said something along the lines. I'll, I'm going to butcher this a little bit, but I'm going to go for it. Uh, it. It's not about not wanting things. It's about wanting less things or the right things. You just don't want to be in a position where you start a, you you acquire something or get something, and then the list just keeps on growing. It's essentially desiring. It's not it's not losing your desire. It's desiring less, or maybe more of the right things that are meaningful. So, how do you think about that? Yes, I love that. That reminds me of something that Liz and I have talked a lot about, which is also realizing that what you want is not always then what you're going to get. So we talk about comparing the nitty gritty, which is like, okay, like I want all these things or I think I want all these things. But then when you actually get into understanding what that person's life is really like outside of their highlight reel on social media, you might realize like, oh, I I don't actually want 
those things. And the list of things that you truly want might be become smaller. So, you know, as an example, Liz, she saw on LinkedIn that a friend of a friend had just become a manager at Google of, and I think she was managing like 200 people. And Liz was like, wow, I feel so bad about myself. <laughs> like, What have I achieved in my life? And then, you know, she thought about it a little bit more and she said, okay, well, what is that person's day to day? And it's definitely in back-to-back meetings and it's definitely dealing with a lot of personnel issues. And Liz is an artist. Like she does all these illustrations for her book and she loves to have heads down time and she doesn't like being in back-to-back meetings. And she was like, oh, that, that would make me miserable. So what is it that I want that I'm not getting? And, and I think there was some sort of cachet and like, oh, the public knows that managing 200 people at Google is like a big deal. So she said, well, what can I do about that that's more in line with the things that I'm already doing? And she started... Um, posting more in LinkedIn to get a little bit more cachet and like get more followers. And, you know, sometimes we look down on that, but, you know, she did a good job and she, you know, she, she got what she wanted. She got that validation that she wanted rather than saying, oh, I need to go have a career change. Uh, So I think it's related. It's like, we, we think we love to have all of these bright flashy things, but in actuality, the day to day of, of taking care of your life in whatever you know, it is that you're wanting might not be actually uh, something you value. And, and meanwhile, this said person at Google is saying, wow, Liz is a best selling author. She got a blurb endorsing her book from Adam Grant on the cover. What am I doing at Google? It's just a bureaucratic mess. Right. <laughs> uh, so, We'll move on to the next one. And to me, this one just hits home, um, uncertainty. Can you walk us through some of the common myths with with uncertainty? Well, one of the first ones is that we we thought that there we could have certainty. And I think this has been stripped away from many of us in the last couple of years. But certainty is is not attainable. And um, you know, we I think as we as we age, we see that happen where health things pop up overnight and jobs go away. And, you know, we sort of realize that. Um, So that's one. And then one that I really like talking about is, is this idea that our anxiety about something accurately reflects the risk of that thing happening. Um, So again, a study we looked at in the book, and I don't know why psychology studies always have to do with giving people electric shocks, but that that is uh, that happens quite frequently, and so they had two groups, and they they said to one group, okay, you have a ninety nine percent chance of receiving a painful but still safe electric shock, and then they told the other group, you have a one percent chance of receiving the same shock, and both groups were willing to pay about the same amount to avoid the shock, even though they had vastly different chances, and so. What's interesting is that the the chance didn't affect their actual anxiety about getting hurt. And in some cases, when we know that something bad is going to happen, like if we were like, you're going to get an electric shock, we'd be like, okay, great. I can prepare myself for that. <laughs> you know, like, so the uncertainty is really the thing that we don't like. And again, this is very hardwired um, as being human. The way I think about certainty and uncertainty is, yes, I think we have some level of control over things, but in reality, we don't really have control over, over anything. You know, what's the, the only two things certain in life, death and taxes, uh, you know, kind of blunt and, and not really an inspirational, uh, (laughs) line to give someone, but how do you think about embracing, you know, trying to control the things you can, but letting go of the things you really don't have control over. And I think that's a really fine line for anyone who's a type A, who's ambitious, who works hard and who has goals in life. Well, in the book, we talk about the withins and the beyonds. So the withins are the things that you are within your control and the beyonds are the things outside of your control. And for the withins, we interviewed this um organizational psychologist, Dr. Laura Gallagher, and she worked with NASA and many other organizations. And she said, you know, even at NASA, they, when they're planning, they refer to their plans as plans from which we will deviate. And we just love that phrase because I think it's true even on an individual level where, 
you know, the benefit in planning is doing the thinking around, you know, what are we going to do if this happens or getting a group aligned around something. And there's value in that process, just thinking through that. But that doesn't mean that they have to stay the same and that we have to beat ourselves up when things do not go as as planned. Um, and I think that was really helpful, you know, when you're thinking about, you know, your personal life or your career where it's like, we were like, okay, well, I didn't control it, you know, fully. And it's like, well, yeah, you had a plan and you did what you could, but, you know, some things are, are beyond that. Um, and, you know, I think um, for me, what's be, what, what has been helpful to me is, is a technique from, from CBT, from cognitive behavioral therapy, which is saying, okay, I'm going to dedicate a specific time for when I'm going to let myself worry about the beyonds, the things that are beyond my control. Um, and so for me, this, you know, often happens when I'm going to bed and I'm like, okay, it's, you know, 10 PM. And now is when I start thinking about, you know, existential crises, should I continue to live in this country? All, all the things. And I, and I'll, I have like a pad of post-its next to my bed now and I'll just write down, you know, okay, you know, this is what I'm thinking about. And I'll say, I'm going to come back and think about this, you know, the next morning. And usually (laughs) the next morning I laugh at like the big questions that are on my mind. And I'm like, okay, you know, I need to sit down and think about this. Um, But scheduling time can be really helpful. And and segueing to the agreed on, on scheduling time and letting things sit and writing them down. I think you, I think you start to build a track record. You can go back to, uh, and saying, this is what I thought, this is, this is what happened. And I think over time that's helpful. Um, you know, as you mentioned, <laughs> uh, what NASA was doing and segueing to the next point on anger, I couldn't help but think, and not someone I go to for inspiration, but the, the famous Mike Tyson quote, everyone has a plan until they're punched in the face. <laughs> uh, segueing to anger. Uh, great segue, Mike Tyson. Uh, what are some of the myths? Anger is a big one for myths. So um, the, the most common myth is that you should suppress your anger. And this is something we learn really early on, you know, stop being angry, our parents tell us stop being angry. Um, and you either have learned in your your, your lived experience that, that anger is scary, that it can be associated with irrational violence. Um, and you've experienced that, or you've experienced like we never show anger in this household. Um, and so a lot of us don't have healthy relationships with anger. And it's something that I've certainly worked on as an adult. My parents got divorced when I was nine. And, you know, I, I definitely think of anger as something that is, is scary to me. And so I often suppress it. Um, and anger is actually just really a sign that your your body and your mind are telling you do something about this. It's something that I care about has been violated. And it can even be a form of like compassion. So we interviewed someone for the book who said, you know, as a, as a woman or a person identifying as a woman in our society, um, she felt like when she started, you know, she, when, when she was feeling really angry, she'd start crying because that is how she had been conditioned to express her anger. And people were very confused as to what was going on. And um, she was like, no, this is like, I care a lot about this thing that's been violated. And so it comes out in, in terms of tears. So it's just really interesting how, how we have been taught what to do with our anger or not to do with it. And next one, and these are just all so related. Uh, which is something else I love about the book. Burnout. You know, when I think of burnout too, I think people get burnt out, they become angry, they become bitter, they become fatigued, they become tired. Uh, And I I think of anger. uh, You know, I love that we're not viewing it as something that is a negative. It's a real emotion and acknowledge it. But, but why I'm connecting anger to burnout, I think a lot of people get angry when they're burnt out. <laughs> yes. Yes. Let's, let's go to burnout and spend time there. I'm curious with burnout, how do you see that manifesting itself? I do think it's anger. I think it's fatigue. I think it's a lot of, but like, how does burnout, burnout manifest itself? How do we know? Because I think a lot of people work really hard and that crosses a line. Again, I think it's a fine line. So how does burnout manifest itself? 
It's actually, I'm glad you brought this up, and it's very tricky sometimes to see how it's manifesting itself until you have hit a wall and then you are completely burned out. And so, you know, the the symptoms of, of burnout are feeling totally overwhelmed and exhausted, feeling cynical or disconnected, um, and then feeling really ineffective. So feeling like I'm working really hard, but nothing is changing. You know, I go to work every week and I'm nothing is changing. Um, and you may actually be effective, but you just feel like you're not effective. So, but the early warning signs are really key with burnout. So burnout affects our own self-awareness that we are burned out. We are running on adrenaline and sometimes we're even feeling good. So I got burned out after our first book came out and I was working a full-time job and I was trying to do book publicity and I was moving across country and all these things were happening. And um, but I was like, okay, I'm getting things done. I'm checking things off my list. Like I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm like, I've, I've, my plate is really full and, and that can feel good until you get sick or, you know, something happens with your family or, you know, something, you get another work project happen and, and you hit a wall and you realize, oh my gosh, I have been living my life at like 120% and now I can't run at 120% anymore. And it can take weeks or months to recover from that when you have let it go for, for that long. So that's something we recommend is paying attention to those early warning signs, which is that everyone and everything feel irritating. Um, basic activities like going to the grocery store feel overwhelming. The one that I love to share, we've heard from people in our workshops is I would like to get sick, like not COVID sick, but I'd really like to get a cold right now and sort of be forced to shut down. And that's not a great healthy mental space when you're like, yeah, I would like to be sick right now. <laughs> and do you think, how many people do you think get to a point of no return with burnout? More than we think. And it's been interesting as I've shared my story with burnout that people have shared that they have experienced that or gotten real close to the edge with it. Um, many people have experienced it during COVID. Um, so definitely having kids at home, working from home, people have gotten there and needed to switch jobs. And I think this is one of the really hard things is that when you get to that point of no return, it's like there aren't a lot of options. You're like, okay, I need to just end this. You're in such a dire state. You're like, I just need to quit or I need to like take time off. I need to take a leave of absence. Um, I need to move to a new city. Like the, you go into pretty extreme places because you don't know. You're like, I have to totally restructure my life. This is not working. Um and I think that if we were, if we lived in a society that, you know, had more of a safety net or we were able to talk about these things a little bit more openly, that it would be okay um, to, to take some time. So um, Airbnb is a company that does this really well. I was learning this recently that they have um, something called Recharge, which is like, okay, I feel that I'm about to burn out and I don't want to leave the company, which would be my alternative here. And so can I take some time off? And it's not, you don't have to go through, you know, filing for short-term disability. You don't have to, you know, it's not a big deal. It's just like, okay, I need to take a couple of weeks. And that's, I think that should be more normal. But the other thing is that burnout doesn't always come from work. Burnout can come from, you know, dealing with a sick family member or, as I said, having kids at home. And so the answer isn't always, okay, I just need a new job or time off from work. It's it's also thinking about, okay, what do I need to, um, you know, do in terms of restructuring my life to have some more downtime or get some more support? Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm curious, have you ever experienced burnout? All the time. Uh <laughs> And I think about it a couple of different ways. I think, yes, there's, there's burnout from work, uh, which I have experienced. And I think I've gotten better at knowing where my limits are and knowing when to kind of back off a little bit. Uh, but I'm also an entrepreneur and I'm hardwired. So uh, I, I, I'm on pretty much all the time, but I love what I do and I'm passionate about, even though if a lot of the day-to-day -day does not involve things that I'm passionate about anymore. Uh, with that said, I'm also thinking about in the context of bigger issues that we don't have control over. When I think of burnout, I also think we're not gonna, gonna go down the COVID rabbit hole, but like people are just burnt out from COVID. You know, you definitely hear uh, people say like, I just can't do it anymore. You know, whatever it is, the policies and so forth. Like I was watching uh, 
I watch Bill Maher every uh, every every Saturday, and he, he, he's a genius and, and and quite funny, and I think quite good at at, at navigating very complex issues and monkeypox came up and he just says, I, I can't do it. I can't do it. Like, I, I'm not saying it's not a real thing. He's like, I just can't do it. Like, I'm done. Like, we're not talking about it. I can't go there. Uh, and, and one of his guests, uh, you know, who's gay, says, this is a very issue in the gay community. He's like, I'm not, I'm not saying it isn't. I just can't do it. Can't do it. Can't do it. Um, and I think that that's where we are with, with, with COVID and many other issues. People are just burnt and they just tune it out. Um, so something that can lead to burnout is number five, perfectionism. Walk us through perfectionism. Perfectionism is the one actually that when we did poll our, our newsletter readers that the most people had experienced, which I thought was interesting because I probably am a perfectionist in, in some ways, but I don't always identify with that word. And I think that's true for many people as well, where they think about perfectionism as color coded folders and you know having a clean house and all the things and and perfectionism is is fundamentally a fear of failure so it's a fear of like not be good enough whatever you're doing is not good enough and so you have to put in an extra effort and it's something that can actually make us less productive which is one of the myths we think that these tendencies are what's making us, you know, be really great at our careers and be good parents and all these things. And, and actually going, having to go that extra 10% can be a thing that makes us less productive because we're not willing to say, okay, it's just good enough. I'm going to move on. Instead, we have to put more time into something that has usually diminishing returns. So I think recognizing that tendency and that it doesn't always help us can be helpful. One of the, the people we interviewed for the book is a therapist. And she says she has a lot of clients who feel like if they stop being a perfectionist or having perfectionist tendencies, they will become a couch potato, immediately get fired from their job, you know, stop being a valuable family member. And it's like everything goes. And it's it's a very black and white way of looking at the world. And so there's work that we can do to understand that there's a lot of grays between being perfect and being a total failure um, around that. And one of the phrases that um, – we like to share is is using the phrase, I am a person learning to blank. So I am a person learning how to be a parent during the pandemic or to um, you know deal with the uncertainty of news, as you mentioned, um, during this moment in our society that we're living in. And that gives us a little bit more grace. We don't have to get it right the first time perfectly. And the next one, despair. Walk us through despair. Despair is definitely the the hardest chapter for for me to talk about and write about because it was a, a really um, difficult experience for me to go through. So I, I went through a period of despair in the fall of 2019, and as I mentioned, I was there's I was going through some chronic health issues. I had moved. I was feeling really lonely. I was feeling totally disconnected from my job. Um, I was going through infertility, and um, so despair. The clinical definition of despair actually wasn't defined until 2020, which is um, quite shocking. Actually, we, we we use the word depression and we use the word suicidal thoughts, but the but the word despair um, wasn't actually defined. Um, and so there's there's seven markers of it: feeling hopeless, having low self esteem, feeling unloved, worrying frequently loneliness, helplessness, and feeling sorry for oneself. Some of those indicators overlap with major depression or generalized anxiety disorder, but the last three, so it's loneliness, hopelessness, and feeling sorry for oneself, are not symptoms of any other disorder. So basically despair is, is feeling depressed and anxious and then piling on a bunch of other things, and that pushes you into the intensity of despair. That's terrible. It is terrible. It is, it, it is, you know, having been there personally, it is extremely scary um, because it feels like you're just falling into an abyss and um, it feels like, how am I ever going to, to get out of this? And, you know, I had, I had suicidal thoughts. Thankfully I didn't take action on any of those, but it feels like 
you know, when you're having those thoughts, you're like, well, how am I ever going to stop having these thoughts? Because they're so intense and you feel like, how can I go back to the person who I was now that I've had these thoughts? And and I, I think the reason that I wanted to write about this chapter was that um, these thoughts are way more common than we think and that many people do move through them and they're okay. And there's lots of stories that are shared about people having suicidal thoughts and, and taking action on those. And I'm glad that those stories are shared too. Those are important stories and horrific stories. But I do think that many people, and I've seen this after I wrote the book, and many people have come, you know, former colleagues, family members that I didn't know about who said, you know, thank you for sharing that. I also have had those thoughts at moments in my life, and I'm so sorry that you went through those, but thank you for sharing them. And that's what I was really looking for when I was experiencing them was like, you know, do have other people felt this bad? And like, how have they moved through this? And for me, it was time, really, therapy, medication, um, and just taking, you know, really small actions over time that that helped pull me out of that abyss. But it was really difficult. And and how long? You, know, you mentioned time, therapy, medication, small actions. Over what period of time did you kind of feel yourself going from rock bottom to, okay, I'm not there yet, but I see there's a way out to fully being out? What did that process look like in terms of time? Well, it it was very gradual. So in the beginning, I was having those thoughts multiple times a day, and then it was like once a day, and then maybe once a week. And um, and then maybe once a month. And but honest, so there was an acute period where I was coming out of it that was maybe like four to six months. But then I think, you know, it took about another, you know, year, year and a half to really feel like, okay, I have some distance from this enough so that I can write about it because I feel like I'm not in it. I'm glad we're talking about it because there's clearly a mental health crisis and we're dealing with a lot, you know, you know, knock on wood, we're coming out of COVID. A lot of people have been isolated and a lot of people, their lives have been completely disrupted. Um, a lot of people have lost lives and we're navigating a new world that is very complicated and there are a lot of complex issues. Um, and there's an opioid crisis as well. <laughs> so there's just, there's just a lot going on. Um, and so do you have any, and I know everyone's situation is unique, but do you have any, you know, advice or words of wisdom to someone who's, who's, you know, you're going through the, the as you outline the checklist for despair, someone who's maybe going through it, obviously seek professional help, but any other advice to someone who's, you know, maybe going through the same thing right now? Definitely seek professional help. Um, I think, you know, for me, medication was helpful to get like, to be able to do the work in therapy that I needed to do. Um, and, you know, I think there's still a stigma on antidepressants and, um, unfortunately, and I think that they can really make a world of difference. Um, for me in the, the, the worst part of it, it was really just about getting through the day. And so I would say to myself, can I get through the next hour? Can I get through the next four hours and then it'll be 8 p.m. and then I can go to bed, you know, and, and just really chunking hour by hour, can I get through this? And the more you're suffering, the smaller the bits of time that you have to chunk. Um, and then it's about setting these small daily intentions. So there was a period of time where I like could not get out of bed. I was doing nothing. And then it was like, okay, I'm going to go to the drugstore today. And, you know, the previous version of myself, previous Molly would have been like, okay, so you went to the drugstore today. Like that's your accomplishment in comparison to what you previously were able to do during in a given day, you know, but I had to let go of that judgment and just say, okay, I went to the drugstore today, you know, and, and it's, it's a little bit 10 steps backward, one step forward. And then it's sort of two steps back, one step forward. And, and, and over the, the series of months, you know, you, you start to take care of yourself again. I also think reaching out to people who have been there and get it. And then those people surprise you. So, um, you know, there was friends where I sort of was able to open up and be vulnerable and they were like, oh yeah, like I've, I experienced that at one point. And I was like, I had no idea that you went through that during that time. Um, so there's a difference, you know, we, Brene Brown, she explains the difference between um, empathy and sympathy and empathy is when someone's trying to understand 
what you're going through so they can figure out how to be helpful. And sympathy is looking down at someone from a better place and sort of like, you know, you poor thing. I, you know, I, I, I wish there's something I could do. So fr- finding friends and, and even finding people in support groups online who can be really empathetic to what you're going through. Well said, well said. And definitely, um, you know, I think the key message here for me is you're not alone. And I think, you know, after seeking professional help, I think this idea of letting people in, you will be surprised by how many people you know have also suffered. Um, so the, the last one, regret. That's a big one. Regret is a really challenging one. Um, again, something that that we have all experienced. We, we cannot live a hashtag no regrets life is one of the myths that we talk about. And regret is... Again, an emotion we can learn a lot from if we allow ourselves to. So it feels horrible. Like feeling regret is just like, ugh, like it's a punch to the stomach and you don't want to go there. But it's something where we can say, okay, you know, what do I know differently now about what I can do moving forward? And most of the time you made the best decision that you could in the moment. So sometimes we we have self-sabotaging regrets where we're like, yeah, I knew better. But for the most part, we just didn't have the information that we do now. And so beating ourselves up is not always that helpful. And instead moving into a place of, okay, what could I do differently in the future? And sometimes there's not a lot that you can do differently in the future. So Liz talks about in the book, um, her her mother's mother, so her grandmother um, died um, several years ago now. And she Liz was very busy at work and she didn't go with her mother to help her mother like empty the house that her grandmother had lived in in Germany. And she she now feels really bad about that. And she feels like, how could I have let my mom do this alone? Um, and there's not a way that she can fix that. She can't go back in time. But she can make different choices in the future in terms of showing up. So um, her, while we were writing this book, her father was going through um, a health crisis and she immediately flew out to Chicago where she's from, you know, it's fine. I work and wait. Um, So she, she makes different choices now. Um, And I think the other thing with regret is that we will always have some sort of like alternate live life regret, a lives regret where we feel like, oh, you know, what would it have been like? And again, I think it's similar to comparison where it's like, you know, we feel like maybe, oh, our lives would have been better if we had a different job or we married a different person or all these things. Um, But we're not thinking about the nitty gritty, the day to day of all of the, you know, just ups and downs we would have had in that alternate life anyways. Yeah, it, it's a big one. It's a tricky one. We did a show with Daniel Pink, who just wrote a wrote a book about it. And and to me, the big takeaway was, look, you're going to have regrets, and you know the no regrets is is, is BS, if you will. You're going to have regrets, and the key is develop some self awareness. And you can't change them, but you can change the future and learn. You know, when you have a regret, try to recognize what's really happening and, and see what you can change in the future. So you don't make the same type of regret twice. Um, and, you know, in, in closing, I think that's sort of the, what I like, really like about your book is these are all big feelings. They're not fun feelings, but they're all, they're all, they're all feelings we have. Don't try to run from them. Don't try to avoid them, but it's how do you acknowledge them and how do you develop the self-awareness and the tools to harness them for good because there's no getting around the big the big seven so to speak um so in closing you know the, the book's fabulous i hope everyone picks it up um, and it's filled with such so many great personal stories and anecdotes but great research i'm curious like what was the most surprising research you came across while while writing this hey, we, we spoke with a lot of psychologists and psychiatrists which i i hadn't done before and you know, I think it's sort of obvious to them. And and I would say that, that like in an alternate life of mine, I'm like, oh, it would have been nice to sort of be, I mean, it's a, it's a really difficult job, but I think what they have access to is seeing just how common these emotions are. 
And I think that was the missing piece for myself. And we did our own research. We sent out a survey to our readers and we said, you know, how, which of these emotions have you experienced in the last six months? And like 99% of readers have experienced multiple of these emotions in the last six months. But again, we don't talk about it, you know, and I think we're starting to do that now after COVID. And I think that's, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for that silver lining of people being more open and willing to talk about these things. But I wish that I would have known that. I was just really surprised at how many people experience these on a day to day, if not, you know, week to week basis. Um, and that they are really hardwired in us. And there's a there's a real reason why we experience these things. They feel so bad. And yet there's usually a deeper need if we listen to them for what's this trying to tell me about something that I should do differently or think about differently. Well said. Molly, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. 